Welcome to another episode of It Was All a Dream with me, Daniel Ewing. I have a special guest with me today, a uh, very unique, very unique individual, very unique story. I'm excited, man, for, for him to share his journey and his story of, uh, of, of where he's come from and, and what he's been able to achieve and all the things he has going on now. Uh, former uh, high school draft pick, uh, into the MLB, out of high school, 17 years old, uh, had a career in, 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 in baseball as a professional, uh, played in the big leagues, uh, played in the minor leagues. Uh, guy also is a, is a two sport, a dual sport professional, uh, had an overseas career where he played overseas professionally uh, in basketball. Uh, helped me welcome a good friend of mine, Josh Jones. Hey, what's going on, D. Ewan? Hey, I surely appreciate you uh, having me out today. That was a, a heck of an uh, introduction, so I surely appreciate that. Oh, man, I, I appreciate you. I really appreciate you taking the time out your schedule, man, and chopping it up with me today. Uh, so first off, man, let's, we, just, we have to just protocol based on everything that's going on now. I mean, just how, how, you, how have you and your family been during this, during this pandemic? Man, every, everything is uh, – it's good right now. Um, everybody's healthy. Um, the boy is doing good. Wife is doing good. Uh, organization is doing well right now. We haven't had any any cases of the corona, so I pray it stay that way. And uh, basically, man, everything is going good right now. Just trying to stay out of, like you say, just do the necessary things to stay out of harm's way, you know, and, and only go places where we need to go. Right, right, right. Well, that's good to hear, man. That that you and the fam as well. You know, I know you have a you have a fairly, not newborn, but your son is just had a birthday not too long ago, right? Uh, he just yeah, turned just, just just turned one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I mean, of course, I mean, you guys, I know you guys are trying to be extra careful and cautious, you know, about you know where you go and who you come in contact with. Uh, but man, like, so we we'll just start like this, uh, just kind of. For the people who don't know who you are, have no clue who you are, uh, and and for those who do, uh, but just did, don't know the full story of of Joshua Jones, just mm -hmm. kind of tell us what was what was your initial dream growing up, or did you did you did you have a dream growing up, and and if so, what was your initial dream of you know of? Uh, well, Josh Jones, uh, Joshua Jones, um, grew up on the southwest side of uh, well, actually, I was raised in Missouri City. Um, went to E.A. Jones, uh, then left E.A. Jones, ended up going to Louis Welch, then after Welch went to middle school. And I was always a, a, a baseball fanatic. Like, baseball was like everything growing up. But in the environment, you know, um, basketball and football was kind of the, the social type. So baseball always took a backseat in the public's eyes of, success but man I've, I've growing up it was always my dream to be a, a professional baseball player and uh when i say that you know uh, i always tell my kids man like growing up i would pray every night um uh, that god would grant me the opportunity to allow me to uh play professional sports uh professional baseball at that so i mean i, I started playing baseball at three years old at hunter's Glen. uh so i started okay yeah, Hunters Glen over there, at the Hunters Glen Little League, and then uh, then I went to uh, stay. I went to uh, South Post Oak, played over there at South Post Oak, over there by McCullough. Right, right, uh, right. And then my mom, we moved to uh to the Houston area. So once we moved to the Houston area, uh, I started playing at West Bear Little League, and that's kind of where you know I got my uh, I started to develop uh, as far as a baseball player then, man, and. It was just always my dream, D, to to play at that level, man, and and it was hard, you know, because like I said, it wasn't socially accepted. It was always football and basketball, so I had to kind of carve my way around, you know, uh, that stereotype of you know being a baseball player in the inner city, you know. All so right. you kind of know the, the not, stigma. Not, not to good. cut you, not to cut you off, Josh. Uh, so okay, like you said, growing where we grew up at, right? Like the more popular sports. And mostly in the in, and we didn't grow up in the inner city, but we also didn't grow up like in the suburbs, right? You know, uh, but so for the area that we grew up in, we, it was it was predominant. Most city is predominant, like the old most city is predominantly black. 
So in your black communities around the world, I would say for the most part, you're growing up the major sports of basketball and football. Yeah. How did you get involved in baseball so early? You said you started at three. Like how did like who 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 put you in baseball or like how did that how did that happen so early? Well, my dad was a uh, softball player, so he played over there. He he played slow pitch softball that uh he used to always play at that sportsplex on Main in '90 out there. Right, right. So right. he uh, he introduced me to the game at an early age, man. Uh, you know, he put a, a baseball bat and a tee in my hand with a, and a ball, man. And, and since I was young, you know, um, and people know my story. Like, I just I just gravitated towards it, man. My dad introduced me to it, and I never really knew any other sports but baseball, you know. So I didn't grow up playing, like, basketball and football. Only thing that I was introduced to, or shall I say my parents introduced me to, was uh, – was baseball. So that's all I really knew, you know. So that's that's kind of how I gravitated towards the baseball area of my life. Right. And that's kind of I me, mean, like you said, that's and we talked about a little bit off air, but that's kind of how a lot of black kids don't get into baseball because we're not introduced out of all the sports that we, you know, that we have a chance to play or can play. We're not int- for the most part 9 out of 10 kids Black kids, especially growing up, are not going to be introduced to baseball, you know, mm-hmm. as as their first sport, you know. Sure. So it's either going to be basketball or football. And now, you know, you, you have, you know, just depending on where you're growing up now, you have the option of possibly playing soccer. You know, you have, you have, but baseball is kind of like the last resort. The last resort, yeah, for, for sure. For parents to put their, their kids in, in a sport or in an activity that they're like, all right, man, like, all right, maybe basketball didn't work, maybe football didn't work. All right, it's like, all right, do you want to try baseball or soccer? You know, like them, like it's like the last resorts that we have to trying to right. help our kids, you know, get be involved in the activity and, and, and do a team sport. Uh, so, but no, that's that's I like I was always wondering, like, man, how did Josh get involved in baseball? And then for you to say that you started at three, so like you said, your dad was a softball player, you was introduced to the game early, and you just happened to fall in love with it and really enjoy it. So I understand right. it more now. I just knew my D I and it's crazy because I think at a young age I just knew my uh my path. And it's crazy I say that, but like growing up EA Jones, you know, me, you know, we went to school together as 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 youngsters and I mean I see you all in the gym, right? And like I knew my lane like when I was young. Like right. I knew like and it's crazy to say that because it sounds like with me being let's say nine, ten years old. You know, I kind of knew at that time, like, basketball wasn't my thing. Like, I knew athletically at that time, I was, I was short, you know, I was, I was a little plump. I didn't, I can shoot, but I knew, like, if I want to excel at a sport at the higher level, you know, I got to kind of go with what I'm good at. And at that time, baseball, I knew I wouldn't play football. Like, when y'all was playing with the Southwest Steers and, 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 and all that, I knew I would, football wasn't my, my forte. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I knew. Well, it was tough, you know, D. It was tough because it wasn't accepted. So I was always like, oh man, that's the that's the baseball player. Like he a, he a loser. Like, you know, like when we playing basketball in the gym, y'all over there hooping on the big goal, and I'm like over here with who knows who <laughs> on the side goal. You know, and it was like it was <laughs> Yeah. Hey, it was that's, tough. Crazy. that's crazy that you say that because as a kid, I never noticed it. Like I've known you to be a, you know. Like like you said, we grew up. We went into elementary together. So at PE and and at recess, we one of the two of the best play. You know what I'm saying? Two of the best athletes on the playground or in in, in PE class. So I never even looked at it like, oh yeah, he didn't really play this sport or that sport. But now that you say it, and the fact that you say you grew up in Mo City and then you moved to the Southwest, right? Like I didn't see you playing. Like I know you didn't play for the Steers because I played. And then I didn't see you playing at South Post Oak basketball, but you say you played at South Post Oak baseball. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I knew I knew my lane, man. It was like I knew, man, seeing like you play and you know, and, and and I knew like I knew what my lane was and I knew baseball was like my calling. It wasn't it wasn't until eighth grade to ninth grade, man, where I went from five eight to six six three. And I just met a you know, you know, when you're young, man, you just hang out with like a group of friends, so I, you know, and, and I'm kind of, I don't want to get off subject, but we're talking about just my, my career, and I know like basketball was, 
was I always say it's the gift and the curse because basketball came so easy to me because baseball was so hard. Like uh, I could always shoot, but I never thought about playing basketball until I met a group of friends at Westbury, man, and and they said let's go try for football. Play my football career lasted one game. <laughs> I got hit, I got hit, left my stuff on the field. That was it, man. And, uh, I went man, you walked off the field, Josh. So, so I, <laughs> let me elaborate on this story before we get going. So, you know how, like, when you're doing the kickoff return and you have the two guys that's the return man, then you had the three guys that form the wedge, you know, right. in front right. of the return man. So, I was that guy in front of the return man. So, you know, when the ball come to you, you're supposed to fall on it, right? That's what you talk. Yeah. But when yeah. the ball was kicked, like I had you trying to shine. Like I was, yeah, I'm like, it's my time. Like <laughs> you trying yeah, to I shine. Got, I got hit so hard, bro. Like the coach was like, Yeah, you're gonna be on varsity next year. I was like, nah, coach, this ain't meant for me, man. Like, I'm not <laughs> I'm not built like this. Like these guys was angry at, at, at breakfast and the game wasn't until eight o'clock at night, and these dudes just angry. So I knew football wasn't for me, man, and then I just went and tried out for basketball because I had some friends that was like, let's go play basketball. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I went hoop, man, ended up making the team. But baseball was always my forte, man. Uh, I, like I said, I was introduced to it real early. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got the, the – my dad exposed me to, you know, buying me a baseball bat and getting me a nice glove and just kind of introducing me to the game, taking me to Astros games. You know, and uh, so that's kind of how, you know, I gravitated towards baseball. So, all right. So you, you talked about a little bit and we, that's, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to transition into that next, but t can you talk a little bit about the actual, like the youth baseball experience for you back then? Cause this it's way different now. And you know, this because you have your own organization, but back then in the, in the mid, mid nineties, late, the mid nineties, uh, or early early to mid nineties, how was how was the youth baseball league for you? Like the levels and then was it was it travel teams back then for baseball? Uh no. Travel teams came around maybe like my my junior year going into senior year. Of high school. Year, yeah, high school. Wow. Uh, before then, man, like select baseball wasn't wasn't big, but then when it was big, you know, you didn't really have any other inner city kids playing because they couldn't afford it. Uh, right. You know, it wasn't like the Jaguars and the Superstars and the Hoops where you had like sponsors and they pay. Baseball was just you had to pay for it because it was it's a wealthy sport. Right. You know. Um. So when I was growing up, man, we just had athletes and and <clears throat> you know, it's it it wasn't the coaches' fault because they didn't know they were there just because they were nurturers. They were coaches that wanted to you know be mentors more than coaches. So my my like little league career was more so I didn't really get the development part I was just an athlete that was had good hand out coordination was fast you know I had power but I didn't really understand how to play the game because we never really had leaders in that position that can you know teach us what we needed as far as to be successful you know on the baseball field so my whole like youth career I kind of just grew up playing on athleticism and just ability you know potential so all right so before we go on before we transition to what how things happen for you in high school mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about just the i guess the 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 subject of the lack of african american black athletes playing baseball right like you been you yeah, making yeah. it you being drafted can you talk a little bit about that and like maybe kind of encourage or, you know, persuade some of these younger kids because everybody's not going to make it in basketball. Everybody's not going to make it in football, but you might have this, you know, it's a lot of talented kids who are just not skilled enough to make it in those two sports, but very well could be, you know, uh, the next Josh Jones or the next, you know, the Ken Griffey or, you know, the next whoever baseball player, uh, but you haven't been introduced to it and you don't think that, you know, that's a sport for you. Can you kind of shed light on like, man, how, how important it is for, for the, the young black kids to try to be more involved in this sport. Yeah. Um, you know, I always tell my kids, like, you know, even with my organization, it, it wasn't until I had a mentor that was, you know, an African-American that was a black man that, that made me believe it was possible. 
right? Because growing up in baseball, you always hear like, you know, the stigma of, you know, African Americans don't make it to that level. Uh, it's only 5% of black baseball players in the professional baseball career. So you grow up thinking like, okay, what is the, uh, the ceiling for this, right? You know, you have that 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 belief but then you know you don't have the person or the object to put the, the bigger vision with it you know so it wasn't until I met a mentor man that that actually was playing professional baseball at the, at the time that really gave me that push you know because uh, I, I was growing up and I kind of felt the stigma of the same thing you know you hit a professional ball player saying you know baseball isn't fair for African Americans and and you hear all of those things and you try not to let it affect you but then, you know, if you hear something over and over and over again, you start to believe it, you know. Right, it wasn't right. until I met a mentor, man, uh, when I was in high school that, that gave me, you know, a vision. You know, I always tell, I always tell people, uh, a lot of people want to be successful, but they don't know what success looks like, right? You know, I can be working out every day in the gym, dreaming of playing professional basketball, baseball, football, but what I see on TV isn't reality. That's a dream. But when I meet somebody that played at that level or that's been at that level, that's a that's actually reality to show that, hey, anything is possible. You know, so I, I kind of made that guy my mentor and he gave me the extra push to believe that it was possible. You know, and, and, and that was it, D. Like, you know, growing up in the inner city, you know, we all talked about it. But as uh, in the inner city, and I want to say the black community too, when you get to high school, like baseball isn't socially acceptable. Like, you know, nobody was going to, like, high school thinking, oh, I'm going to play baseball. Like, I'm going to be cold. I'm going to get the girls. Like, everybody always thought, like, baseball was just the last place. So it was kind of hard for me going to Westbury in the beginning because that was the stereotype. Like, that was the, you know, baseball was south in, in the Westbury. It was in the middle of the southwest. Everybody played basketball and football. And the baseball team, it wasn't many blacks there. Because when I was at Westbury, man, we probably only had two, at that time, two or three black players on the team if that you know so um i just had to get a mentor man i found a mentor that played at that level d and he and he kind of gave me the nuggets and the tools to in the in the insight to you know follow my dreams and show me what it looked like man that's that's good to hear man that's i mean like, that's a message in itself you know uh for for who for anyone young old however old you are man you are, you and you are aspiring to be something right? That you're not yet, but you have the dream of becoming something or doing something. Uh, find you a mentor if, if possible, right? Uh, find sure. you a mentor, find you somebody who has done it, that you know, that can pour into you, that can, you know, that can support you and, and give you the knowledge and the wisdom of, you know, of what it takes and what they've been through to help you get to where you at, man. And uh, like I said, that's, that's a great message in itself, man. Like you, at a young age, you realize you needed that and uh, you seek you seek that out, man. I, and I'm glad to hear that you, know, you was able to find it. And I mean, and, and it shows that it paid it paid off for you. Like I said, you was making it professionally in any sport, man. Is you know is is the odds are against anybody. I don't care, you know, no matter what what color, you know, what race you are, you know, what you know, we don't. It, the odds are against you because that's like you said, that's not really. It's just so it's 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 only so many spots on the team. It's only so many teams, you know, and, and it's so much talent and so many uh, different dynamics that go into you know unless you just just flat out but phenom but it's, it's so many layers of things that has to happen for you uh so man you know hats off to you man for, for your journey and, and uh like i said that's i love I, that that's a great message just right there in the middle of everything yeah so I mean, uh go ahead no i was just saying d like that's I, and that's why i have a passion for for giving back to uh to the to these kids man is because you know, you only you only can dream as your vision is what you can see. You know, and and it take it only take one person to believe in you to make your dream come true. You know, just like you know your journey to uh to even let's say from Coach Courtney to Duke. You know, when you playing ball at Duke, like you know, like it was even though we're the same age, man. I like you know even when we used to watch you play on Saturday mornings, man, against North Carolina or whatever, man. Like like I say, you're so humble about it, but you know, you, you it's, it just takes, like Coach K, believing in you. And like to say, I'm going to put you in the starting lineup, and then as a freshman, you make, you know, ACC all, 
the tournament team and, and you know stuff like that. So I got a passion for giving back because if it wasn't for somebody, I wouldn't be who I am. Right, you know, right. so I, I firmly believe that you can only dream as far as you can see. So for these kids and our youth, man, it just you got to be that mentor. So, so like you say, I agree. Every every young man out there, young lady, young whoever you are, aspiring athlete, student, you know, find you a mentor that that can groom you and and give you the jewels that it takes to keep going. Right, right. And like you, I don't have my own program, but you know, I I work with you know kids, especially basketball wise. Uh, yeah, for me, man, I just it's like it's part of my responsibility now, right? You know, especially now I don't I'm retired. You know, I'm around these kids. I love, you know, I love the game and, uh, you know, I'm at a different phase in my life, but just being in the gym, seeing kids trying to get better, trying to go to different levels of, you know, of, of their career, whether it be, you know, trying to make varsity in high school, trying to, you know, get a scholarship, trying to, you know, whatever, uh, your, your first or second year in college, you're trying to, you know, you finish college, you're trying to become a pro at, you know, at whatever level, just mm-hmm. kind of you know, being a consultant, a mentor, just, you know, hey, man, I'm here. Like, you know, I've been through everything that you guys are trying to do. And some of you guys won't ever even experience the stuff that I've been through. But, you know, I'm here. But, you know, you got to get the, you got to get kids to understand, like, to use your resources, right? For use sure. your network. And that's a big thing about, you know, I would say the black community, right? We we grow up with so many stigmas about, you know, not trusting people or not trusting and then, people don't open their mouths to receive right. the help that they can receive when they have it available to them. Sure. Right. So we'll go ask this person over here, this person over here, this person behind me, but you got a person right in front of you that, you know, had, they has all the information you need that has, you know, that has everything they can, they can give you all the answers you're looking for, but for whatever reason, you won't, you won't use that person. Right. Yeah. You won't. Yeah. You know, so, uh, I, yeah, so man, I, I, I'm like you, man. I just, you, I think of it now as like, hey, this is my responsibility to to give back and and you know and to and to pour into these kids that I'm around, these young men that I'm around, the best way I can. And uh, it, it's it, it's easier, it's a lot easier when when these guys are openly asking questions. You know, mm-hmm. all these kids are openly asking, all all young ladies uh, are openly asking questions. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for 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 both parties. For sure. But but Josh, man, okay, so baseball, you 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 realized baseball was your thing uh from an early age. It was kind of socially awkward because like you said, baseball is not the sport. Kids are going to middle school saying, I'm gonna be the starting, I'm gonna be the starting first baseman. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be, you know, like you go to middle school or whatever, you you're little league, you know, I'm I'm gonna be the starting point guard, I'm gonna be the starting quarterback, I'm gonna be, you know, yeah. we're not talking about I'm gonna be the starter or anything of baseball. We're not talking about that. But anyway, so you get to high school, you go to Westbury predominantly black school uh baseball is what you're doing but you say you become a two-sport athlete yeah you become a two-sport athlete talk a little bit about so you, you you said a little bit about it earlier about you know how your friend you 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 got around a group of friends who convinced you to just try for the basketball team but talk 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 more about your your two-sport uh your two-sport experience the it became crazy like like when I try to explain it, like sometimes it don't really make sense because it's like baseball, I look at, and I don't believe in gift and curse, but I look at like baseball was like my gift, right? But then I became back, I became so good at basketball. Like, I don't want to say it was my curse, but it stopped me from being, I was good at baseball, but let's just say I didn't fall in love with basketball. I think I would have been great at baseball. Right. You know, like for baseball, I was 6'4", 205 my senior year. So you know how in pro they draft you off of potential, you know. So, man, I, I get to high school, man, and it's like 78 kids in the gym, right? And we go and try out. And I'm like, man, look, I'm just going to go try out. You know, like, I'm with my homeboys. Like, I'm going to just go try out. Like, you know, we got dudes in the, that's in the hood that's playing ball, and they cold. Like, they, you know, they've been playing basketball their whole life on Chimney Rock. So, man, the cut went down to, like, 40, 40 people. And I was on the cut. Like, I made the cut. I'm like, well, damn. I'm like, all right, cool. And then next thing you know, it went down to 20. And I'm on the squad, right? So we we 20 deep now. Like, I'm like, man, I made the basketball team. So then before you know it, report cards come out. We down to, like, 12. And then the season start, and I'm the starting, like, shooting guard on the basketball team. And I'm like, Hey, like, all right, cool. Like, so 
you know, I grew up at, you know, the Westland YMCA was like our home right there on Fundra, man. So that's all we did was play basketball all day. So, like, I'm on the basketball team now. So now I have motivation to, like, get in the gym and go hoop, you know. So I start gravitating towards basketball friends because, like I said, in, the, in those days, in, in those inner city schools, basketball is socially accepted. So, you know, I, I made the basketball team, man. I ended up starting as a freshman, led the team in scoring. And then after the season, the head oh, coach. Oh, oh, oh. pause. My bad, Josh. You you was on varsity as a freshman or you no, made? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I led the freshman team in scoring. Okay, okay. You just made, yeah. you just decided to try for basketball and you was on the fresh. Okay, I got you. Got freshman you. Team. This is the freshman team I'm talking about. So after the fresh, after the freshman season, the varsity coach comes up to me. It was like, hey, I need you to, uh, I need you to like really put in work this off season because you're gonna be on varsity next year. And I'm like, dang, like so that kind of changed my whole perception of like I'm a great baseball player. But then I'm like, man, I made the team out of 70 people. Then the coach come tell me like, hey, you're gonna be on varsity next year as a basketball player. So I start kind of losing my focus in baseball. And I don't want to say losing my focus, but now I had to figure out a way to manage three things, you know, being my grades, then managing baseball, and then managing basketball. And then baseball and basketball season overlaps. You know, so when basketball season ends, baseball is like two weeks into their season. So, you know, I never really had that, that time where football and baseball is two different seasons. But, but yeah, man, I end up, I end up um, making the varsity team my, my sophomore year. And then uh, that's it, man. And I, I became good at basketball. And a lot of people don't know. Um, I had a full, I had a full ride to UMass in basketball. Uh, okay. Out so of high school. I, so before we get to that, because we gonna, we like I said, we want I want to cover all that, man. Because like okay. your your story is is very unique, man. You was a two sport professional athlete, right? Mm -hmm. That people don't know about. Uh, but so you you was on. You made the var you was on varsity as a sophomore. I'm a sophomore where yeah. are you? Where are you as far as varsity JV as baseball now? Where uh my freshman year, I was still on uh the freshman team in baseball too. Okay. So your sophomore year, you were on varsity in baseball also? Yeah, yeah. My right. sophomore after my freshman year in baseball, the coach came to me and told me, Hey, you're gonna be on varsity. Uh because when I was at Westbury, my first year D, they had, like I say, only had like one black kid on the team. So it was a predominantly white team. Uh, and, you know, the, our coach had a stereotype of not liking, you know, African-Americans. That was a stereotype. I, like I said, I don't know if it was true or not because he didn't show that way towards us. So, you know, naturally when I was hearing that, I was just gravitating towards basketball because I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'm, I'm cool with basketball now. But then the coach told me, like, after my first year, like, hey, you're going to be on varsity baseball. You know, so I ended up playing varsity baseball my sophomore year um, and basketball my sophomore year. Okay. So we're going to save the baseball for later as uh, far as what you did in baseball in high school because mm -hmm. I will get to that part later. But you became pro in baseball. So we know you was good in baseball. So yeah. you, was, you, was, you, was, you was getting ready to tell me about how good you had became in basketball. You had – became good enough to where you received a D1 scholarship in basketball. Your second sport. This is your second. This is this not your first. This is not your first option. This is your second option. Second, D. Mm -hmm. I had uh, I had UMass. Uh, I had Rice. Um, and I had a couple. Of, I had, like, some Ivy League schools. Uh, Louisville re reached out to me a little bit. They was recruiting me a little bit because, you know, we played for the Jaguars. So, you know, we went on the road. So, I was getting exposure in basketball. Um, yeah. All right, so but, so not to cut you off. So let me help people understand also. Okay, so Josh picked up basketball in high school, basically. And just to put it in perspective, Josh and I and I played against Josh in AAU. Josh was Josh was on one of the main Nike teams at the time back in Houston for basketball in AAU. So that's just to put in perspective the type of skills he had. Like he just wasn't like a lot of kids nowadays make varsity and that, you know. Not to be harsh, but they're not really that good. Yeah. But you know, when you can go play on AAU teams and you know and have a significant role and get the like you said, you you was on Nike AAU, so that's a 
that's a big circuit. And I'm, yeah, and I know you was you was getting playing time and had a pretty big role. So that's just to put in perspective how good you had become at the game of basketball as well as what you already were in baseball. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that was it, man. I played with the Jaguars. I started getting, I started getting a uh, exposure in basketball. D, and to be honest, man, like my 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 love or my focus shifted from baseball to basketball just because I was receiving letters in the mail and uh you know I was I was getting the Nike shoes you know before they came out and you know I'm I'm walking around school and you know getting the notoriety from being you know being on the basketball team and and uh having some uh some success early so I um I I naturally drifted away from baseball not drifted away but my 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 priority then became basketball because baseball starts slowing down you know baseball is a slow recruiting sport so I started playing basketball man because I like I said I'm going to the YMCA every day and then you know I'm hanging out um with uh with with Lucas and these guys and we're going to the workouts and I'm doing these drills and um you know I find myself becoming real good at basketball so um I just gravitated towards the basketball aspect of things man and and I kind of put baseball on the backside because b basketball season came first. So, you know, um, that was kind of just my story with the basketball, man. Just, you know, when I started playing with the Jaguars, uh, Elaine sent me to the top 100 in the West camp, Nike camp, my freshman year. Um, and I went out there to San Diego, had a, had a decent camp, man. And, and then basketball started taking off from there. So I kind of, you know, gravitated towards playing the basketball game and uh, baseball kind of went on the back burner until basketball season was over with. Man, so you was really out here hooping. Like to say hooping. that you to say that you wasn't initially a hooper, that that wasn't what you was pursuing. You was really out here hooping, man. Like you was really, yeah. you had really became, you had really became a hooper. Yeah, I, I, and, and and if I wasn't at Westbury, they, like we we were, like I never forget. Like we we wasn't coached. Like I just knew I can always shoot. You right? I was a short, chubby kid at Ed Jones. I can sit in the corner and shoot all day. Like I'm I'm a, I'm a hit the three. Like, I might not be able to do nothing on transition or uh, get rebounds, but I can shoot. So, like I say, basketball became – it came easy to me because I, I was I, – I had grown. I lost weight. I was 6'4", 190. I was slim. And, you know, I can shoot. So, I just started putting everything together, man. And and, and, and that's why I say I, I start gravitating towards basketball because I, I started seeing a future in it early as opposed to baseball where that didn't come later. All right. So – so let's talk about that. So you say the baseball recruiting recruiting process is a slow process. Slow process. So you're starting. You you're a sophomore, a junior. You're already on varsity. You're playing AAU. You're on the Nike circuit. You're getting all this recognition now. You know for being a hooper. You you're getting interest from schools and universities, and and you're seeing these different coaches at these tournaments in the summertime, and you're going up against some of the best players in the country when you go to these different camps and tournaments, right? And uh, you know, and that's and that's all love, especially when you know when you plan and you get to play well, and you know that's actually exciting for any kid, for any teenager. But then you have the reality of, I mean, I'm also good at another sport, right? Baseball, like that's your that's your love, like so. Uh, talk a little bit about that recruiting process. When did that pick up? Uh, and how you know, and 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 you can end it with how how you made the well. No, no, you you fine. No, that's cool. Uh, uh, no, but yeah, when did that pick up? And then. Did that become? Did it become more of a, of a battle between like what do I pick? Nah, D man. To be honest, in baseball, you have to have somebody in your corner working for you, because baseball recruiting back then wasn't like uh, it wasn't like basketball as far as AU and you travel. It wasn't social media where you can like upload video. So to be honest, like I I went so my junior year I started going to these MLB workouts. Mm -hmm. So I would get invited. I worked out for maybe about 15 MLB teams. Um, I would say around 10 to 15 teams, just individual workouts. But, D, I didn't have any baseball scholarship. Like, I didn't have my senior year, like going into my senior year, I didn't have a baseball scholarship. So mm -hmm. in my mind, yeah, in my mind, because I didn't have any connections as far as when it came to baseball, like, 
being being a, a African American baseball player in the '90s, the late '90s, early 2000s, it wasn't a lot, a lot of us playing Division One baseball. You know, uh, if we did, we was going to the SWAC. You know, TSU, PV, you know, uh, Grambling, and I wasn't. Not to say I wasn't. I, I was too good for those schools, but before I went to those schools, I was going to go play Division One basketball before I played a lower level uh, SWAC school for baseball. So my senior year, I had no scholarships. Like. I worked out for like 10 or 12 MLB teams, man. And so in my mindset, it was like professional baseball, or you going to play college basketball, you know? And I didn't have any college baseball scholarships. So I had TSU, but that was it. And I wasn't going to TSU. So uh, my, my last baseball game, man, my senior year, my last game uh, after the game, uh, Anaheim Angel Scout came, was at the game. And after the game, he came up to me and he gave me a card. He was like, you know, I enjoy watching you play. Um, I think you have a future in the professional level. Give me a call tomorrow. And, I, and, and I, he gave me the card my last game. We lost. We weren't going to the playoffs. You know, I was, I was bummed about it. So, you know, and I worked out for like 10 MLB teams and nothing had come from it. Like, it was just dead silence. So, in my mind, I'm like, man, my, bas- my baseball career over with. I'm like, I'm done. Like, I ain't playing baseball no more. Let me get back in this lab. Let me go put some shots up. Let me get ready to go play basketball. Like, I'm done. Like, when my last senior game, D, I, I like, took off my baseball uniform and was like, this is going to be my last time wearing a baseball jersey because I had nothing from there. Like, it was right. crazy. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of the, of the story. So, I'm like I said, you cut me off when you want to start asking questions. But – but, yeah, man, my baseball career is over with. Like, I was in my mind, I'm like, man, I'm going to go, you know, look at these basketball options. I started going on visits. I went to Rice. I went to Southwest Texas, like, back then, Texas State. So, I started doing my basketball visits, and um, that was it, man. And, and he gave me his card and was like, give me a shout. And um, I went home, put the card up, never called the guy. And about, like, two weeks later, you know, it was like I, I, I was asleep, man. And so I woke up, I, when I woke up the next morning, like for school, I ended up, I went to the restroom, got the card, called the guy, man. And, and he met me at Westbury that day. And he told me like, hey, what took you so long to call me? And I was like, man, to be honest, I was just out of it. Like I've been hearing so many, you know, uh, leads to playing pro ball and getting drafted and and uh, nobody has followed up on it. So I just thought baseball was dead, man. And And so, but today, some told me to call you, and he met me up there, man, and that, that's when my life changed, just like that. So, man, so <laughs> that's crazy. That's, I mean, like I said, you, I, I, you, don't, you think the recruiting process for all sports are pretty similar. Uh, mm-hmm. For you to say that you didn't have not one, well, you, basically not one scholarship. I mean, we, you had one scholarship, uh, but not, like, not to the level that you was really thinking about. But you had one scholarship your senior year to go play baseball. And here you are, uh, you end up being uh, drafted at 17 years old uh, by the Anaheim Angels. How, like, just can you talk a little bit about that? Like, the actual realization of, like, man, I'm, I'm actually, I just got drafted. I'm only 17 years old. Talk about that and then what the process, process of you actually still going to college. Yeah, uh, so what happened to you, like, I say I would, and this this might take a couple of minutes to explain, but right. nobody really knows my testimony. They like, I share it to people that's close to me, but you know I don't. I'm not really a a person that just talks about my career. But but uh, basically, D, what happened was, man, I never forget. Like I, I always say every night, D, my prayer was because my mom was like, "You go and get your education. If you go play pro ball, I don't care. You still going to college. Like you're gonna get your degree." So long story short, you know, I always knew I had to go to college. So my prayer every night was, was God, please, like, make a way for me to play professional baseball and college basketball. That was my prayer every night. And when the guy gave me that card, you know, I called him. He came up to the school. He worked me out every day. He's like, man, I'm going to make you a professional baseball player. Like, you're going to be a – and I'm like, yeah, all right, man, whatever. Like, I heard that before. So, so uh, long story short, the signing day comes, 2001. Maybe like a week before signing day, um, I had I went on all my visits and I had one visit to uh, Dillard, which is an NAIA school 
And I took the visit because I wanted to go to New Orleans. It was doing like the Mardi Gras time, and I ain't never been to New Orleans before. So, right. you know, they go, like, I'm going to go take, take a visit. Yeah, take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. So, I went down there, and the coach offered me a full ride, and I'm like, yeah, all right, coach, man. Like, I ain't, I ain't coming to no NIA school. Like, I'm good, but I appreciate it. You know, I kind of like big league. I'm like, yeah, all right. But I had a good visit, like, in New Orleans, going to HBCU, you know, seeing what their life was like. And i never forget, man, like a week before signing day, uh, UMass, Rice, and uh, Southwest Texas was kind of like – well, UMass and Rice was like my top two schools. and. Uh, Actually, the coach, the assistant coach, Chris, was at UMass, and he was recruiting me heavy, man. And and going into the offseason, he got uh, – he signed with Villanova. The coaching staff from UMass, Lupus and all of them went over to Villanova. So that kind of hit the – that kind of slowed the Hawks on that. He offered me a full ride, but then they went to Villanova, and they took over the program there. So it was like, well, let me see what we have here, you know, we, we got to see what our recruits are like here. So I'm like, all right, well, they go, they go that scholarship. And then the Rice coach was like, that went dead, right? So I'm like, dang, like it's signing day and everything just like goes. Falling apart. Yeah. Fall apart. So I'm in here like depressed. Like, man, I had all these schools. And long story short, man, that I, I got, I signed with the Anaheim Angels. And if I would have taken money, I wouldn't have been able to go to those schools to play because I would have lost my amateur status. And I ended up with that full ride to Dillard University, bro. So, like, God, like, ordained, like, he guided that whole path to where I was able to play professional baseball and I was still able to go to play college basketball and get my education, you know, that route. So I ended up going to Dillard University in New Orleans, um, just to get my education and play basketball. And then when the basketball season was over with, then I would head to spring training and play baseball. So I was a professional baseball player and a college basketball player. So that's kind of how my path ended up to where I was. So you say when you signed with the Angels out of high school, uh, you didn't sign uh, actual – You was so you wasn't, getting, you wasn't on salary? No, I took money. So my signing bonus. So okay. once I – my signing bonus, I lost my D1, my NCAA eligibility to play at that level because I, I received money to play a professional sport. Okay, so I understood what you said wrong. Okay, so so that's you did take you did take your sign, you did get paid, right? You were an actual that well, that's what makes you a professional athlete because you, you're getting paid to play a sport. So you, yeah. you did get paid. So the fact that you did get paid so, to help people understand why you were still able to play college basketball. So you did get paid, but the fact that you went to – you wouldn't have been able to play at a D1 level, level. Yeah. based on the NCAA rules, mm -hmm. but you were able to play at the NAIA level uh, yeah. even though you were a professional athlete yeah. in another sport. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, how I ended up, that's why I ended up going NAIA because my mom was so keen on, you know, uh, education, education, education. So I ended up going there so I can, you know, get my degree while I'm playing baseball. So that, that, was, that was like my, my journey. That's how I ended up at, uh, at, 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 uh, at Dillard, man. So ended up at the NAIA school, and I would go play baseball. I would go play baseball in the offseason. I mean, not in the offseason. I would go play baseball as soon as the basketball season was over with. I would head straight to get on the, get on the plane, go straight to the Arizona and go to spring training. Okay. So, man, that's – you you a college you a you a college student athlete and 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 you're a professional athlete all at the same time. Talk at about HBCU. right at it yeah not, you're not yeah at a in New at a HBCU <laughs> at a NAIA uh, mm -hmm. in New Orleans and then you flying from New Orleans to the other side of the country. Talk about that man, like especially that first year. How was that for you juggling? Man trying to do these things it was surreal d because it's like for the first time i had like my own money right so i like i got my own money um you know and i was low-key about it like i didn't i didn't even tell like when i went to college i was like you know what i, I want to be low-key you know i don't want nobody to know i'm playing professional baseball like i want to be low-key because i, I want to see what's real you know i want to see like you know, because you go somewhere, uh, they see a 17-year-old playing professional sports, you're going to have friends gravitating to you. You're going to have the females gravitating to you. So I tried right. to, like, stay away from, 
from that uh, from that that uh, the stereotype, man. And we was in co- we was in practice one day, and I never told my teammates I was playing professional baseball. I think I told my roommate or something, but I never told like the team. And, and the coach was like, I never forget like my college coach made a comment like, "Yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna ride on this nice charter bus that that Josh gonna buy us with that money he got from the Angels." <laughs> Yo, he calls so, you out like that. Yeah. He calls me out like that. So after my coach said that, man, like the word just took off around campus. Like all my teammates like looked at me different. Not looked at me different, but they, you know, it, it seemed like my life in college was surreal, man, because it was like, oh, that's Josh. She a college basketball player. And then let it be known, like I made All-American. I was an NI All-American at the school. So, you know, my, after, my, after my freshman year, I made All-American in basketball. At Dillard, so like I was, man, I was all American at the on campus. Then I was playing professional baseball, so it was a, it was a different environment, man. It was, it was something that was, like I say, I can't, I enjoyed it, man. It was like I had the clout on campus. Like we had football teams, so basketball was the homecoming, you know. And yeah, so you was a big dog. You was a big dog for real. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and you, sure. and you in New Orleans, you a hooper, you all American, and come to find out. You got a little bit of bread because you're a professional yeah, athlete. Exactly, yeah. So that was it, man. So that's that's how that came about, man. And uh, like I said, like it was a it, man. That HBCU was a it was it was amazing, man. Like I, I and that's what made me like get out of there because I never forget the like I always say like man you like we would be hooping right and I'm all American we hooping like but man we playing this side Willer Ridge gym like you know so. I look on TV, my dog shining at Duke. I'm like, man, D, you and I here get buckets. You playing in front of 40,000 people, like, on ABC. Yeah. And you getting it. And I'm looking at me like, man, I'm playing. You know, I'm, I'm wasting my time here, man. Like, I, I, man, I just, this Rudy Poo, like, we playing in front of 5,000 fans, you know, Lil Wayne, a DJ. It's cool, but it ain't like what I picture, like, my life being as an athlete. So that's right, what right. kind of, like, just – gravitate away from the NAIA stage and just and then go straight baseball. So um that was it though, man. I I was living the best of both worlds at that time, man. Had has had a little bit of money, man. Was was on a full ride. Um uh, all American basketball. So that was a good two years of my life right there. So for your first so your first two years you were still playing basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh all right. So let's all right. So when did baseball so after your sophomore year you're strictly baseball for the next two years? So what happened was um, my sophomore year, uh, we played HBU in the, uh, in the uh, NIA national tournament. And I, uh, I ended up, I don't know, I went off that game, man, and, and we beat them. They were number one in the nation. That's when they had Rod Neely. They had Rod Neely and all those guys over there. So we ended up winning. And then the assistant coach at HBU at that time, uh, Steve Parker, we was we, man, we was walking across to shake the hand after the game. We just upset him. Dillard, we was like, we came in with a record of like 14 or 18. We was like, we was just on vacation. You know, we, we ain't going out to win no basketball game. We just made it to the tournament because we won our conference tournament. So we ended up beating the number one team. And after the game, the, uh, the coach whispered to me after the game, the uh, kid, you know, he said, hey, I'm leaving here but I'm going to call you because I want you to come to this college I'm coming to. So I ended up leaving Dillard, going to play at a Division II school. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but you can still play D2 and be a professional athlete. You just couldn't do D1. Uh, so I ended up going to Arkansas. But when I was going to Arkansas, I got, I, uh, I got, released, by the, I got released by the Angels, and then I got picked up by the, by the Reds, Cincinnati Reds. So I had to leave Arkansas and focus on baseball full time. So that after my sophomore year, I got to the Cincinnati Reds, and then that's when I became like a full time baseball player. Okay. So let's just rewind just for a little bit. All right. So your first few years, you're juggling being a college student athlete mm-hmm. and a professional athlete uh, for the Anaheim Angels. Talk a little bit about those first few years, baseball wise. Like, what was like, what was the biggest difference from what you had been seeing in high school? Because you didn't go to college. <laughs> All right, so, college. so what was what was the adjustments that you had to make or that you couldn't make that made yeah. it, you know what I'm saying, that was that was difficult for you? So, um, 
man, when I got to pro ball, did I realize like I was always the guy at the top of the totem pole. Like I was always the best player on the team um, in all my career from, from baseball, from high school, baseball, basketball, to college basketball. And I got the baseball, like, I come from Westbury. So my last baseball game, I probably seen a guy throwing like 84 miles an hour, like not fast. Uh, and I never get my first spring training game. And I see a guy out there throwing like 98 miles an hour. And I'm like, damn, like, you know, this is a whole nother level, you know? And, and um, it was a, it was a shock to me. It was a very, it was a humbling time because, you know, you get to that level, you realize everybody's good. You know, everybody is, like, good, and you have a few guys that are great, and those right. are, like, your superstars and mega stars. But, but it was an humbling experience because I realized then, like, I wouldn't be able to do both. You know, I knew I wouldn't be able to do both because there's no way I can compete with these guys being the best of the best. And here I am. I'm still competing. Like, I would play basketball. I would, I would literally play baseball, like, I had a month after the basketball season to get ready for baseball. And I would mm -hmm. go to baseball and compete. Like, I would get in spring training and, and compete with those guys that's been playing baseball year-round. So, at that time, I knew, like, hey, if, if, if I gave this game everything I had, you know, I sat down with my parents and my, and my mom, and I just told them, like, hey, you know, I know you all want me to get my education, but, you know, i never forget when I – my last day with the Angels, uh, my manager then had told me, like, uh, if – he was like, hey, you in the lineup today. Because, you know, I don't know how it is in basketball, but, like, in, in, in pro ball, you know, everything is basically nonverbal. You know, when you walk into the locker room, there's, like, a lineup on the wall. So you don't know, like, if you're starting, you don't know what, what, you're, what you're batting. Like, the coach is not talking to you. So you walk <laughs> in and, like, all right, okay, I'm in the lineup today. Yeah. You know, the next day you walk in, you're like, damn, I'm on the bench. You know, so you don't really know mentally how to prepare yourself. So I saw myself in the lineup, and I go tell my manager, like, hey, I knocked on the door. I was like, Skip, you know, uh, this is going to be my last game. He's like, man, you my starting center fielder. Like, why are you, you know, my right fielder, where you going? And I'm like, man, I'm going back to school. He was like, man, shut the door, right? And he was like, let me tell you something. You have an opportunity that kids dream of, you know, that people work their whole life and still don't get the opportunity to do what you're doing. And he's like, as you get older and, and as you keep playing this game and you keep leaving here to going back to college where anybody can go to at any given time, you know, your window of opportunity is getting smaller, you know, it's closing up. And I'm like, all right, coach, all right, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I'm like, all right, man, all right, Skip, I'm going to holler at you. Like, and I left. And lo and behold, and behold I, uh, after my last game, man, you know, in pro ball, you know, they don't give you jerseys. Like, you know, you don't get your jersey. Like, you can buy it, but, like, nobody's giving you, like, your jersey. So after my last game, the club, he come to me, man, and he's like, hey, you know, I'm giving you a, a, a going away gift, man. Like, here go your jersey. And I'm like, what? I get to have my jersey? So I go back to college, like, stunting. Like, I got my game jersey. I'm, wearing, I'm walking around campus. And then about a month later, I got a phone call and it was released, man. So I'm like, oh, that was just a parting gift. Like, that was <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so – so at that point, that's when I realized I got to do this full time, you know. So, so that's when my first time getting released was like a humble experience because I was 17 years old, man. So to me, I didn't know how to appreciate what I had because I was so young. Like I'm 18 years old. I didn't know what like the status of being a professional athlete was at the time because I was doing it every day. So right. yeah, that's when I, I, I became baseball full time when I got released from the Angels. All right, so I got a question, man, about the whole baseball transition, right? And I'm not sure if it's for most guys or is it just for a select few guys. But why is it, even when you're like the – I don't like I, I don't want to sound – but when you get drafted in baseball, even if you're a high draft pick, is it protocol to send guys through the minor leagues just to, yeah. you know, is that like – that's like for everybody or is that just, just like if you really – everybody. So even like a first – the first pick of the draft. He's going to minor leagues for some time. Yeah, because because the, the game is so hard and it's a mental grind. You know, so like in baseball, D, we playing games 29 days out of 30. You know, so we don't have off days. You know, you fly into a city. You know, let's say you, you, play a, you play a game in the minor leagues. Let's say minor league game. 
you play a game and then you get you get out you get through with the game at at the Sunday the the the, the travel days the game's always early, and you get off the you get through with the game you get on the plane and then you fly into a city you get there at four in the morning, the game is the, that day, you know so you go to see you gotta wake up and be at the park at one o'clock so you're right off day so it was just a mental grind of 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 playing at that level that was so tough of you know like getting on the bus and playing and getting up. Like, we didn't have off days. So, you're like, you know, in basketball, you fly into the city, you got two days off, and then you play, you got one game. Like, we're doing four-game series, and then you leave there, go play another four-game series, and we got one off day out of 30. So, I think the minor leagues is just a, a, a stone to get you better because you're going to see better competition, but it's also prepared for you to get mentally tough as well. Right. So, so it's basically kind of what – the NBA has done with the development of the league, right? Or, you know, what they're trying to implement more of, okay, we have this, we have this developmental league for the guys who not saying it, you're not good. You're not there yet. You're good. And most likely you're going to be, you know, at the NBA level, uh, but we're going to draft you. We might even draft you high, but we might not need you now, but we have this, we have this system in place now where you can get developed and learn and, 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 and play and develop and, and, and really learn how to be a professional, right? That's, that's you being it. 17 years old, how long did it take you to really be, to realize what it, what you needed to do to be a professional? It, at those two years, those two years woke you up or like you still didn't really know going into no, after you got released? I didn't know until I got released because it was like, it was humbling then, you know, because what I was doing was working, you know, like, I didn't, I had success in basketball. I was having success in baseball and I was still able to compete, you know, with giving baseball a quarter of my time, but it wasn't until, you know, it's like what you see every day with your own eyes, you tend to unappreciate it, you know? So it was like when I got released and I, I, I wasn't playing again, man, it was like, I'm sitting at home and I'm like, man, I'm scared to show face, you know, because my whole identity, my whole life was, you know, being an athlete. You know, and, and that's kind of, you know, why I always say what I what you do for a living is not who you are as a man, you know, right. because, it, you know, once you once what you do, you don't do it no more than who are you as a person. So that right. was like the first part of maturity is when I got released. And then I I sat down and was like, man, like my my uh scout at the time who signed me with the, the Angels, he ended up going to the Reds. So he was like, look, man, we're going to give this one more shot. But. If you're gonna to come to the Reds, I need you to be like all in on baseball. Like the Reds didn't agree to me playing basketball. So that's when I at that time, that's when I went to my full, like, all right, I gotta grind for baseball mode, you know. So that that's that's when I really became like mature in the situation of prioritizing my career. Cause when I was 17, I I was 17 through 20 with the Angels, and I was still too young, man. I didn't I didn't know what I had then, you know. But think about what you just said, bro. You still like, you still a kid, man. You twenty years, you nineteen, twenty years old, trying to be a professional in a sport like baseball, right? Where, like you said, like it's real technical. Like you know what I'm saying. So just the the slightest bad mechanic can make can make you make the difference of you being a professional or not, right? No. Uh, you twenty years old, right? Trying to be a professional. You you had started this journey at seventeen. <laughs> at 17, 17 man uh just talk a little bit about like how you grew maturity what you changed so now you got released you had the second shot at, at with the reds uh talk man, about what really changed for you mentally to help you you know to help you I, I think what changed is my life outside of the field you know because the we 17 18 we got players cards you know you get to the lead they give you a little player card you know so we going out. I'm like, you know, I got my crew. I got my player card. They all come in the VIP, you know. So I was more so like playing professional ball early for the perks. Right. Like, because I, was, I wasn't old enough to understood, like, to understand my purpose with what I was doing. So back then it was just like, oh, man, this, this the man in the city, like, 18 years old. So it wasn't until I got released and then I realized I missed it. You know, like, i never been without the game in my whole life. So that time when I got released, man, it was like I have never not played baseball. 
you know. And then I realized, like, man, Josh, you was a professional baseball player. Like, you was tripping. Like, you know, if I get if I if I get cut at college, I can go play at another school around the corner. But I can't just get a professional contract when I want to get a contract. So that was the time, man, where I actually matured. You know, I I I took some time, man, away. And I was in the I was in the, a deep place for a long time, man. I was in a deep place for a few months, you know, just because I felt like I squandered away an opportunity because I didn't give it all I had. And there was a point in my life where I was like angry at my mom, and I was like angry at my dad. Like I I, I went through those phases of of uh, of life because I felt like I had the opportunity of a lifetime and I didn't take advantage of it, you know. So, so like, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I'm, no, you good, you good. No, so just not to talk, not to actually have you, uh, no, yeah, no, no, not to actually have you, for lack of a better term, regurgitate your feelings for your parents, you know, during that period of time. But can you talk a little bit about the lack of knowledge? So we talked about that earlier, right? So you not mm -hmm. really knowing or having people in place that can like, look, it's like really you needed somebody to tell you when you got that contract at 17, like, look, you can't go do, you can't go play college basketball. Like, there you go. That's, that's, like, you you needed that at 17. You got that two years later, but that's what you need to hear at 17. But coming from where we come from and uh, like the black communities more so, or, you know, inner city kids, we don't have, we don't have the mentors for the most part. We don't have the people who, who's had those experiences or have that knowledge to tell us, uh, you know, Hey, this is how, this is how this is going to be. And this is how this is going to go. If you want to, you know, when we get to certain levels, I'm talking about, you know, when we get to like the level you got to, the level I got to, uh, we've all made mistakes because uh, it's not that we didn't want to do better. We just didn't have the information to do better, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, the saying goes, you know, if you know better, you do better. We just didn't know better at the time. So we made some mistakes that you know, we look back on like, dang, had I known this, that, and that, like, you know, I would have, I would have did this differently or I would have been far better off than what I was at that time. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about that's kind of like what it sounds like your situation was? Yeah, because I felt like like my son, like like and, and and you know, my mom, you know, it was always education. That's a full scholarship. Like, so at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, you're gonna play pro baseball, but you got a full scholarship. I ain't gotta pay for college. Like, so I took it upon like, you know, I'm I'm gonna do what's right by my mom because she raised me, you know. Her mom, my dad was divorced, so I felt like I owed my mom what she wanted because, you know, like, that's my mom. So um, when I got done with that, man, it was just like, like, my son, if my son, if, th if it's his dream to ever go play pro ball, like, and he get the opportunity, like, I don't, I, I'm not going to say, like, you're going to pass this up to go play college just because I know like what I know now, not having that mentor is like, you can't get that time back. Like you can say, for instance, uh, I got, I'm going to be a number, I'm going to be a, 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 a 20 round draft pick in basketball, right. Out of high school, but I'm going to go to Duke because I'm going to get a, a hell of an education. And then I'm going to try to go play pro again in two, next year, my freshman year. Like what happened if you go out there, let's just say like, you know, like, like a Zion or say you go to Duke your freshman year, you tear your ACL, you know, and you, and you end up not pursuing what you had the opportunity to pursue. Right. So that was my, that was my whole mindset, man, was that I was just angry because I had the opportunity that, that I just let get in the way and I wouldn't do it again. Because what I, what I realized, D, and I don't know if it's like that with, in the, in the, in the level you were at, but I felt like college coaches, wanted to have authority they wanted to feel like you needed them in every school i went to i was playing professional sports so my coaches knew i had other options so they didn't have that control over me where i've had coaches man that was like jealous of my career just like the coach made the comment about the chart about the charter bus and you know he would make sly comments about me playing pro ball because i felt like at that point i was 17 years old making more money than my coach would make, you know, so I didn't need you. I'm playing basketball because I love basketball. But at the end of the day, if you treat me like shit, I can just leave, right. you know, but I felt like mixing those two up wasn't good for my career either. So it's just things that I've learned over the course that I'll pass down to my kids. If he get the opportunity to other kids, but 
going all over again, man. If you get the opportunity to go play pro, like, and that's your dream, I just feel like you got to take it. You know, you just got to put all your eggs in that basket and go for it. I mean, I, I have the same stance, man. And uh, like I said, I didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to go pro out of high school, but just knowing what I know now and, and knowing what I've learned over the years, uh, like you said, you can always, you, you can't always go become a professional in any sport. It's not mm -hmm. something you can always go do. Uh, you can always go back to school, right? Especially if you go be a professional and, and you have success and you're successful and, and you make, you know, quite a bit of, you know, quite a bit of money. You can always go back and pay, pay for yourself to go to okay. school. You can't always have the ability or have the opportunity to become a professional athlete. So that's, that's how I've always looked at it, man. And uh, it's just, unfortunately now for basketball uh, athletes, basketball players, they don't have that opportunity. Well, they do, but they don't have it to play at the highest level, right? So you can go, guys are now skipping college and going to play overseas in China and Australia and these different places. And now the developmental league has, uh, you know, opened its doors and its opportunities for guys to come, you know, do do this new uh, new thing with them. But you know, the NBA has to get back to allowing uh, guys who are good enough yeah. to come straight out of high school and, you know, and, and get right to it. Uh, because you do have, I mean, you know, if they're not ready when once they get to their teams, you still do have the developmental league to send them to, to you know, to nurture them and develop them and, and you know, and, and, and kind of bring them along slowly. But uh, like you said, somebody could very well go to college and not either not play well, right, and it, it hurts the draft stock, or God forbid, you know, they have a career, career ending, you know, threatening injury, and, and now everything is, you know, now everything is, it's kind of out the door. So, uh, yeah, man, like uh, to all aspiring <laughs> future athletes, uh, current athletes, and you want to be a professional at any level, in any, at any sport, man, really, uh, really seek the, the advice from people who's, uh, who's been there when you have to make these choices of, you know, what you, what to do and how to do these things. Cause uh, it could be the difference between you being successful and you not being successful. True uh, fact. No, so right. okay, so you get to the Reds, man. You you had a wake up call. You just got released by the Angels. You get to the Reds. This this would be your third year as a as a professional baseball player. Fourth, fourth year. Fourth, fourth year as a professional baseball player. Uh, what year are we in now? What year is this? Two thousand five. All right, so I'm I'm still in college. You're your fourth. I'm on my fourth year. <laughs> I'm on my fourth year uh, uh, in college. You're your fourth year as a professional. All right, so 2005, man, you, you're with the Reds. Uh, talk a little bit about that that year with the Reds. Uh, your time, talk about your time with the Reds. It was a little tough, man. Um, that was the first time I actually seen, like, how, like, the – I'm going to try to find the word to put it because you play pro. So it's like – when you go to different teams and you see like how well they treat their players or the facilities and you see like the, the, the living arrangements, that, that kind of off the field activity was like the first time where I actually started seeing how that can affect your mental capacity as a pro, you know, as far as the treatment from the front office and everything there. So uh, my first year with the Reds, man, was, was kind of tough, man. Cause I went, I came straight from the angels First class, you know, we, 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 you know, we had uh, nice facilities, you know, everything was very first class. And in my first year with the Reds, man, I was just kind of like in a culture shock because I felt like even though I was a pro, I wasn't a pro because I felt like the facilities wasn't where it needed to be. Hey, you know, like, I know uh, exactly what you mean, man. And I didn't, I mean, for me, I didn't, I wasn't able to switch like actual NBA teams. So, uh, I'm gonna let you get back to it, but I know exactly what you mean. Coming from Duke, right? That was like professional. Like Duke is like it's we we have just about not everybody, but you know, you, from the four teams I played on, three or four guys going pro. You know, every other year. You know what I'm saying? So that and just the way we do stuff, first class. We all all the Nike gear. We one of the biggest programs in the country. So Duke for me was like was almost like the NBA, especially as far as the talent. You got Coach K, who you know who's been around, and then I get drafted by the Clippers at the time. Who was one of the worst, you know, one of the worst organizations in, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying, in 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 the, in the NBA back then, and the practice facility, the front office, all that stuff was like, I'm like, bro, is this really like, 
Like I, I had I had better at Duke than I am right, right yeah, now. Had, yeah, like like you know what I'm saying. Like it was like stuff was better at Duke as far as like how things are supposed to go and how things are supposed to look and run. Uh, as and I'm like, this is like this can't be what the NBA like. We was practicing basically at a Lifetime Fitness. That's where our practice facility was at. No, you think I'm joking? I'm, I'm dead. Right. I'm yeah. dead serious. I am dead serious. Our practice was it was called the Spectrum. It was like a Lifetime Fitness, but it wasn't and it wasn't really even like closed off like. We getting dressed and taking showers with the people who got memberships to the, you know what I'm saying? So you got, yeah. So you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know, you you getting dressed and getting ready, and you got Tom, Dick, and Harry just right there in their towel, just talking to you. Any, you know what I'm saying? Just saying whatever whatever's on their mind about how they feel about the game or the Clippers or whatever the case may be. Like man, uh, are you, yeah, you, are you practicing? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, like. But so so your experience with the Reds was was nah, very different. It was different. It was like, if this would being a pro is like, I don't know, like, I'm because I'm, because I because now I get to compare it to something else, right? So like my mental my mental mindset was more on that on that aspect then of let me just get paid and let me try to get traded or let me just survive what I can survive, you know? Because I wasn't happy in the mental capacity because I'm like, man, like I had it all over there at that team. I guess it's just like you say, like. You're going from Duke to the Clippers, but let's just say let's say you're going from the Lakers to the Clippers. I mean, you know, I don't know. I'm not in the NBA, but let's just say you go from, you know, I get, no, I get, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I wasn't that busy, man. So I, I was there one year, man, a year and some change, and I just wasn't happy, man. I I was at the point to where I was like ready to just, just to walk away from the game, like man, like this ain't what it is, you know, like because I I tell people like all the time, it's like. I don't think people understand the concept of having money. They understand the thrill of having the money. Right. Because once you have the money, your life becomes normal, just like everybody else's. But people on the outside look at it like, man, like he living the life, but it's just the thrill of having it. Then once you get it, you realize you got problems just like the next man. So at that mm -hmm. point, you know, I was just in, I was just lost, man. I was playing pro ball, but every day I would go to the park and I didn't, man, I was just mentally checked out. You know, I was just like, man, is this what I want to do? Like, I already had some money, so I'm like, man, I can go do me a business, you know. And then in my mind, I'm like, Shh, man, I, I I still hit my, like, basketball agents hitting me up, like, man, you want to go hoop overseas? So in my mind, I'm like, man, I can still go play ball, you know. So I just, I was, man, I was everywhere. So I wasn't there, man. I wasn't there mentally. So so I ended up being there one year, and then – uh I got my release from the Reds, man, and then I took a year off, man, just to kind of – I took actually a year and a half off to decide what I wanted to do with my career. Like, do I want to go back and play baseball or do I want to go play basketball? So I had one more year of eligibility left. So that's when I ended up going to HBU. So I ended up playing basketball at HBU. All right, time out, time out, bro. Yeah, yeah, time yeah. Out. Time yeah. out. No, uh, time out. See, yeah, that's, that's – that's, that's, like I said, that's why – that's why, man, like, I've tried to pick people that I know, like, have interesting stories, you know what I'm saying, that's, I think, really fit the podcast. Uh, I, I had no idea you played for HBU. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just talk a little bit about, because that's important. Like I said, being young, trying to have to make these grown-up decisions, yeah. right, important, possibly life-changing decisions that, you know, uh, some of us had to make at 17, 18 years old. For you, it was deciding to go pro, right? Mm -hmm. Now you got money involved, money that you've never seen before. For me, okay. it was, you know, making the decision, all right, which, which which top program, which top college do I choose, right? That that picking the wrong school, picking the right school can be the difference between you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you making it, you not making it. Uh, but talk, can you talk a little bit about the financial, not how much you made, but financially, yeah. how things changed for you and your family? Was it a struggle? You're like, you know what I'm saying? Like being financially literate, literate did you, you know, did, did, did you know about finances, your parents? What, what, how was that for you guys having money at 17? Yeah, I do. I do thank my mom for that because what she did was she took a bulk of my money and put it away. Um, so when I did sign, I was pissed off at then because I wanted to shine. Like I wanted to go get me a, a bin. <laughs> get your piece of, get your piece of chain. <laughs> like I wanted to shine. Like I, like, you know, it's all you know. You know, when you're young, we see rap videos and you see like the athletes, pro athletes, and driving the Bentleys and the in the Benzes and wearing a piece of chain. And I wasn't, you know, I was too young to go in the club then, but 
I wanted to shine like that. Like, you know, my mom was like, no, nah, we're going to put this money away. You ain't going to be able to touch it for 10 years, but you'll thank me later. So she left me a lot, but she took a lot. Right. So I think what really had to change for me was my environment. Uh, so shout out, as, shout out to moms for that, man. Cause yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. like I said, a, a lot. Even like I said, it's sometimes we just don't know better to do better. Yeah. So had mom not known, like, look, let's just even if I don't do, let's take this money. If she didn't know that, like that money would have been, it would have been squandered, right? Squandered. You seventeen yeah. years old, all you thinking about is the right now, That's right? It. You're just thinking about the right. You're not thinking about. You're not even thinking about a year from now. You're not thinking about. Five years from now, and let alone you wasn't thinking about a decade from that time. You know what I'm saying? So, shout out to moms for 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 having the uh, the mindset and the wherewithal to say, hey, you know what, Josh? I know you know I know what you want to do and, and what we could possibly do. And I say we because I'm pretty sure you looked out for mom and you did yeah. things for your mom during that time. So, and of course, rightfully so, you're supposed to. But uh, we I know what we could do with this money at the time and what you want to do. But we gonna take. We're gonna take this money and we're gonna we gonna put it way over here. Right. I couldn't touch it for 10 years, man. And and uh she I she ended up I ended up buying like a uh um I had she she I talked she talked me to get like an Eddie Bauer expedition, like you know what I'm saying? So far from a Benz. Far from a Benz. <laughs> so like hey, hey, I never forget dog. I would leave out the locker room. Uh. I would leave the locker room. And you know when you leave out the locker room, you leave out the facility, like you know, everybody's like going out one exit. So you got the fans there signing autographs, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I never forget, bro. I, I drive out the, the big the stadium, man, and I let down the window and, and the kid was like, Mr. Jones, Josh Jones. I'm like, what's up, man? He was like, Why are you driving this? <laughs> I, thought yeah. you, I thought you played like he was like, Why are you driving this? Like I thought you were supposed to be driving, like I thought you were a professional athlete. So like they hit my pride. So I called my mom like, yo, I need to get my money. Like I need to give me a Benz. Like you know. So but I didn't see it at the time, man. But you know, like I had a had an expedition, man. Uh, my mom put my money away, and and um uh, and, and 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 I had to change my friends. And I, and let me not say that's when I realized that your teammates are not your your, your teammates are not your friends. They're your teammates. You know, uh, because you know, in a, in a locker room, competition is real. Right. You know, and I had to really learn how to separate the difference between friends and teammates because I was getting caught up in that whole competition thing of you know I'm hanging out with you, but then you want to go out every night, you want to spend all this money, and you know I, I I can't keep up with you know let's just say for instance let's just say spring training with the Reds let's just say King Griffey right like he. You can't keep I can't keep up with you, you know. And right. if we go out somewhere and the tab is is let's just say 30 grand, you know, for a night, like I can't continuously like just keep up with that. Like, you know, at the end of the day. So I had to really find myself as a person and, and find where my lane was. And and I think that's when it was good to, you know, be be back to the people you grew up with, you know. And I had to really understand, like, man, y'all not my friends, y'all my teammates. And that's that was like the first thing I had to learn as far as my maturation of getting to that level of being a uh, boy. Yeah, yeah. No, def I mean, it, de it definitely levels to – it levels to everything, but especially when we're talking about, you know, professional athletes and the different salaries and the different, you know, status and experience. Like, it's levels – it's levels to everything. And so, yeah, as a young athlete, uh, you have to be careful and very mindful of – what you're doing with your money and how you're spending it and not comparing it to, you know, the superstar on your team or the veteran guy on your team who's been in the league uh, 10, you know, you know, eight, nine, 10 years, who's had two big contracts. Like you can't, you can't do what they do. Yeah. You can't live how they live. So, uh, and, and that's hard sometimes, you know, especially like I said, you young, you don't know, you just, you finally made this, reached this, this pinnacle in your life. You finally accomplished this dream and you finally had money for the first time. And you want to you want to look nice and you want to, you know, you want to buy some things to to make it look like you have made it right. Which don't necessarily mean you made it right. Like yeah. You learn that you learn it after the fact. Right. Like having the bins or having the, like that's not necessarily making you successful. Right. Uh, but we don't know that initially we find that out, you know, the hard way. You know, most of us, we find that out the hard way. But uh, just to uh, talk a little bit about. How how 
your mom doing your mom putting your money to the side early on like that mm. were you able to or did you get the the, uh, the education and the, the knowledge you needed about how to invest or how to save up your money or that still was like you know that no, still it came later they came actually in my adult life like they came like after i got done playing like they came later because you're not really thinking about well let me not say you're not but when you're not raised in like the stock market and investments you're not really thinking about investing because money is coming in constantly so it's like in my mind i wasn't thinking about well let me put away this this hundred grand or whatever it is and let me let me sit on this let me put that away for 10 years because i'm like i'm making that money next year you know right. i'm making that money so you, I wasn't, I wasn't in that mindset because I didn't, I didn't know about it. Like because you mom, weren't taught, you wasn't taught. We wasn't educated to, yeah, we wasn't taught. We wasn't taught financial literacy, right? We wasn't taught finances. We wasn't taught how to invest. So I, that's why I asked you, like, just because your mom had a, you know, she had a kin of, all right, look, we're not gonna use this money. We're gonna put it away. All right, we're gonna put a lot of it away. But then again, like, like I said, I asked you that because you could have had somebody in place to teach you along the way. Like, all right, you put this money, all right, this is, this is what, this is what this money is going to do every year. If this much, you know what I'm saying? Like, but you saying that you didn't have. But it goes back to what you said though, D like I had people that you, well, you know, as a professional athlete, the, you always dread that phone call and saying, Hey, Daniel, let's go, let's go out for lunch tomorrow. Like you always dread those phone calls because you know what that means. It's a financial advisor. You know, right, they want right. to about investments and talk to you about putting money up and investing with a firm and um i just never trusted anybody like i i've always felt like when i was young i want to be able to see my money like liquid if i wanted to yeah, like you i want to you want to be able to go to get it out the bank <laughs> get out the bank yeah so like right I, when i was young like even my pinnacle of my career i wasn't like looking into like the morgan stanley banks and i would not look because i'm like I can go get this JP Morgan Chase account, a Bank of America, where I can just go walk into the bank and say, give me the money I want, like right now. And it wasn't until I got older until I realized that that ain't where the real people no, that's not where you're, That's not where people with money really got their money at. Right. Yeah, so I didn't learn that, that like you say, the, fi the financial uh, side of things. And, and then like how you went back earlier saying who to trust. And I didn't trust anybody because I felt like I worked my – my butt off of this money. So if I lose it, I want to be the one to lose it. I don't want to let anybody else lose my money. So I didn't really get the that part of the of the uh, professional cycle until I got done playing. And, you know, the money my mom put away, of course, accrued over time. But the money I was making, I didn't capitalize on it while I was playing because I was at that mindset. I got it coming in every two weeks. And You're spending it, yeah, right. It, you know, so, but yeah, no, I, that's something that I wish we would have, I would have known back then. But yeah, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's exactly, man, like the kind of stuff I want to shed light on for people like, you know, because if if guys like us don't tell our experiences, right, right, we're not helping the next, we're not helping the next Josh Jones. We're not helping the next Daniel, you know what I'm saying? And like I said, it, sometimes these guys or these young, young, young women or young ladies, they're not going to ask the right questions. But we've been through it, and if we're around them, we got to be trying to get that information out, or we got to be trying to, you know, to, to, put that information out there so they so they know or at least uh have an idea like look man like i did hear you know coach jones or coach josh and I, I you know i did hear him say something about this man i, I might ask him about it you know just because yeah. like you said if you you get in these positions and you don't know or you don't have the right people to telling you the right information you're gonna make this they're gonna make the same similar mistakes that we made which which can be avoided because you have more resources than we did we didn't have i didn't have a a, a, a coach jones to that played professional, you know what I'm saying, that come from my area, that knew me growing up, that I could lean on and ask questions about how, what it takes to be a professional, what it takes to get to do. That was just a dream of mine. Just like yeah. for you, I mean, you had you had a mentor, but at the same time, uh, it wasn't somebody that you that you knew personally, right? You know, it yeah. was it wasn't somebody like in house that you like. You wasn't pretty sure. I, I'm speaking for you, but pretty sure you wasn't just calling them up every day just like hey how you do this how you do that how you, you know what I'm saying how did how you know so and that's the thing a lot of us uh kids now have that they have that advantage over us is that they they're connected to superstar athletes like they have 
they have, you know, phone numbers to a Steph Curry or James Harden, like you know, some of the better athletes because of the, the, the platforms that's made the world smaller and connected, you know, at the different levels of sports. So they can get the right advice, you know, if they're asking the right questions or if they're, you know, if, if they're, uh, you know, if they're willing to listen. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So Josh, man, your story got, got even more interesting. Uh, I had no idea that you, you went back to school. I went uh, back to school. Yeah, so, I had no idea. So, I'm, yeah, we, we get toward, we get toward the end of it. I know I'm taking a lot of your time, but. Nah, you good, man. You good. That's what, I mean, that's what, that's what we here for, man. That, uh, and you good. Unless you got to go, I'm good. I don't, don't, don't want to take too much of your time, but so what happened was, so I, I, I was with the Reds for a year and I was just mentally checked out. I, I was at a point in my life where I didn't know, um, if I wanted to go play basketball, I didn't know if I wanted to pursue baseball. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. So I, I was I was with them uh, for a year. Um, long story short, I come back and open gym. I'm in an HBU. I'm hooping. Like, I go up and I tip back, put the ball, dunk, dunk, put the tip back, dunk in. And, and you know, and, and, and the HBU coach come up to me and was like, hey, how many years of eligibility you got left? And I'm like, one. And he like, well, yeah, I remember what you did to us in the in the uh, NIA finals, whatever, blah, 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 blah. He like, I want that on my team. He was like, you want to play for me? So I'm like, man, I don't know what I want to do. So I'm like, I need my education and I need somebody to pay for it. So I'm like, all right, I'll play. So so uh, I ended up playing for HBU for a year, man. And then um, during that time while I was playing, my uh, – my mentor, uh, well, we know we talk. Uh, my mentor reached out to me and was like, "Do you want to give it one more shot in baseball?" You know, I'm I'm going to the Florida Marlins. Um, I feel like you have untapped potential. You know, if you want to train with me, you know, this is what it's going to take. So, uh, and, uh, his name Bo Porter. By the end, he uh, so I, I did HBU man, and uh, he uh, comes up to me and he talks to me about it. So that year after the season. He tells me, I'm going to give you a year of training because you're not going to play professional baseball until you're ready. So long story short, man, um, I was out of pro ball for a year and a half, two years. And then I finally, I felt like I was at the level I wanted to be at. Uh, so I ended up going, I ended up signing with the uh, Florida Marlins. So I ended up playing for the Marlins for, for a year and some change. And then that's when I really learned the course of free agency of, you know, going into a market as a free agent as opposed to going to somewhere where they have money invested in you. So I ended up playing with the, with the Marlins, man, for a, a year and some change. And, uh, well, that year, I think that was 08. I don't know what year that was, 07, 08. Might have been 07. Um, so I played with them, man, and I had a great spring. Uh, was off to a great start. And they had a draft, and they took they took uh, a lot of outfielders in the first couple of rounds. And, uh Long story short, I ended up getting released. So uh, once I got released from the Marlins, man, I was just like, um, that was it. So then I got, I came back to square one, what I always had to lean back on, with basketball. Like, basketball was always my crutch. Like, shit. Right. All right, well, I ain't playing baseball no more. I'm going to go hoop. So I ran into – well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'll let you talk, and then I'll, I'll go to that second part of it. No, go ahead. So, all right, so, so your, base, your baseball career has come to a halt. You, 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 you probably, I mean, not that you physically, you probably still could go mentally, yeah. mentally, right? You 17 years old, you, you, you kind of had some hills and valleys that's taking a toll on you. And like you said, in the back of your mind, you've always been able to hoop, the hoop. right? Yeah. You've all, and, and you've seen success. Like you've seen, like you've seen it felt success. I see D you in the program getting buckets. I see TJ, I see Los, I see all the kids I grew up with. Getting buckets, and I'm like, all right, well, hold on, let me get back in the lab and get my get my mind right. So, man, um, after my last year with the Marlins, man, I was just checked. I had I had more professional opportunities to go play pro ball after that. You know, my agent was working, and I'm like, nah, man, let me. I'm at that time I was 20. I started pro ball at 17. I might have been like 25 then, 24. About 24. Yeah. Uh, so I was like 24 years old then, right? So, uh. I go down to Fundy, y'all hooping in the program. Like, you going off, Luke is going off, Carlos 
and TJ going at it like they always go at it. So I'm like, I'm like, all right, let me get back in the lab. And so I run into Cyril, Cyril White. So Shout Cyril, was, Cyril, right? Yeah, Cyril. To God be the glory. Cyril was like, Jay Jones, you can still shoot that thing. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. He say so. You want to go on a tour with me to China? And like, I'm fresh off the baseball field, D. Like, I haven't. I got released and I started like working out like in two, three weeks. Like I just started playing basketball and Cyril was like, Hey, you want to go to China? He like, you know, I can't promise you nothing, but you know, we can go on a free trip to China. You can get film, you can get footage, you can get exposure. And man, I, I go to China then and I go off like bucket, like go off. And then I an agency ended up signing me in China, man. And that's when my professional basketball career started. So I went straight from, getting off the baseball field so a month later going to China and then a month later I'm signing a professional basketball contract. So that that life from 17 to like 29 was a blur, man. Like I didn't never really have time to uh, to like let the stuff sink in because like you said, there's so many valleys and peaks. I went to four different colleges, three different, four different colleges and three different colleges and four different baseball teams, and now I'm going overseas in China playing basketball, then I get a basketball contract. So that's how my basketball career started. Cyril, man, shout Cyril gave me opportunity, man, and, and you know, and, and that was it, man. So that's how my basketball career started. So knowing, knowing, what you, knowing what you know now, right, about playing overseas professionally as a basketball player, and then knowing your experience you have as, as, a, as a professional baseball player, uh, especially at the minor leagues, mm -hmm. how similar are the, the structure of things? You know, so like, well, you said, you, well, you said and, and the, the Angels was pretty, was pretty, was, yeah, it was yeah. pretty like a first class everything. But you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get to it overseas, right? Stuff is not, <laughs> like, no, no. <laughs> it ain't no. glitz and glam. I never forget, like, we'll be on Skype. That's when Skype was on back in the day. Right, right, right. Me, KT, Sloan, we'll be like on Skype three-way, like, bro, this can't be life. Like, I'm in an apartment right now. I ain't got no heat. I got to <laughs> sit on the water and take a shower. I ain't got no cold. I ain't got no hot water. Then they like a month late on my money. And they want me to go play the next day, you know, and, and I'm in the middle of weed. So it was just like, I would have, I was like, man, what I got myself into? Like, I'm in the third world country. Nobody speak English. Like, I'm the only American on the team. Like, and that's when I realized, like, man, I shouldn't have never took nothing for granted that I had in the States, you know, you know, so, the, and, and that's kind of where it, it was for me because I didn't need sports anymore because I was financially in a position where I was okay. Right. So I wasn't playing sports just to say it was you know good to make the money, but I wasn't playing it to say, like, if I don't get my next contract next year, I don't know, I'm going to have to work a nine to five. Like, I wasn't at that point in my life yet. So I was just playing it because I love the game. And then when you got overseas, it was just like, you really have to love, love the game to play ball overseas, you know, and, and, and that's. And in that's most when, places, in most places, not everywhere, but in, in most places, yeah, like initially, especially like your first, first one or two years, you really have to, really have to be dedicated mentally and physically to go play basketball overseas. overseas. Yeah, and, but you know, like then you was in, when you were overseas, like you were in like Olympiago, you were at the top of the top. So like you're playing the NBA overseas though, like in but our it's, But it's, it's still the same, the, the same BS is still going on, right? Yeah. The same, it, it, it on a, maybe just not on a, maybe not on the extreme level to your, but like the same stuff, not having hot water, you know what I'm saying? Or money being right. late, just the same type of stuff going on everywhere. Bro, I didn't know that, yeah, 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 so. I mean, I was in the Middle East, man. It was cool. I think I started off in uh, my first gig, official gig, was in uh, Egypt, in Cairo. So I did that, man. And that's when I realized, like, yo, know, like, if I'm going to be over here eight months out of the year, like, I got to really love myself. You know, like, when you're overseas, man, that's when I really found myself. That's when life really started to slow down for me. Like, I was able to, like, detach from the world. I was on a 12, uh, eight hour time difference. So I, I, I was able to like find myself as a person. And, and that's kind of, you know, what led me to my, my testimony with my first year overseas, man. I think I was, I don't know, 24, 25 in Egypt. And that's when I really found myself because I didn't have the friends in my ear 
You know, I didn't have, you know, the different options. It was just like you by yourself out there. You know, I didn't have family. It was just me. So that's when I, I started to find myself, man. So yeah, first in Egypt overseas, I, I did there for a year. I think I was, I was in Egypt for a year, man, and came home. And Egypt was cool. I gave my money on time. That was actually my first experience overseas. It was actually pretty good. And then my second year, uh, I ended up going to Qatar. And uh, I was in Doha, and I got import of the year. You know, my second year overseas, I got import of the year. Uh, so I ended, up going, I ended up going with the national team to the Asian Cups. Then they tried to, uh, they tried to, to uh, localize me and make me a local. And I said, no. Try to get that passport. Passport, yeah, yeah. I said, no. They got pissed off. You know, they, 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 their culture over there, man, they don't, they don't need money. So it was so hard playing basketball in Qatar. Like, you go to a game, and it's like the, the cup championship, and you got four people in the stands, and they smoking hookah. Like, they don't care about basketball, but they just out there <laughs> smoking hookah. So you just really playing, like, ball in, a, like, one-on-one -on -one basketball. So, so I ended up doing that, man. And, and, you know, it just – you know how the basketball journey go, man. I went to all these different countries, man, and, and played overseas. And that was just the journey, man. And, uh, you know. Over so – but you played in some – like, the, the Middle East, which is uh, not, a, not necessarily the most popular places – like for respected basketball, but you played in some dope, like you said, yeah. you played in some dope places, man. Like how was it? Uh, and most of your career, if, if not all of your career professionally if basketball was in the Middle East, in that region, how was it? Like how was your actual experience a as you got used to it? Like how, how was yeah. it living? It was great, man. At, at that time I found who I was and then I, 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 I hate to say it that way. I started like planning for my career. So I'm like, at this point, everything is a business decision now. Like I'm planning to make money. Then I learned how to invest money. So I started learning. You know, at that point I started like overseas, started taking time to study stock and study like the market. And so at that time I was basically playing as a professional then. Like it wasn't no glitz and glamours. It was like, all right, if I go play in Kuwait, I don't care who give me the most money. Like I run off me a contract, but I'm like, I don't care where I am. I just want to make the most money because I know my career is coming to an end eventually. So I ended up, man, I was in Qatar, I was in Dubai, I played in Indonesia. Uh, then I went to China for a little bit, played out there in one of the leagues out there, man. Then I, I came back to the Middle East and ended up going to Kuwait. Um, so, I mean, I've been, I mean, I've been all over there in, in the Middle East, man. So I just really took, I really enjoyed the Middle East for me because it allowed me to be who I, I it allowed me to separate myself. Like it allowed me to, I didn't have any teammates on the team, like any Americans. I was always the only American. Uh, it, was a, it was a Muslim country, so it was very, like, low, like, slow. Like, the world, those countries over there is, like, slow. Like, you can't yeah, really go a lot of restrictions. Restrictions. So it really allowed me time to mature and, like, really find out what I wanted to do in my life as far as a purpose, man. And that's when I, that's when I came back, man, from playing those years overseas and, uh, it's just like, man, I'm, I'm, I really found out who I was. And um, I just wanted to – that's when I started my baseball academy. I started my baseball academy going into, like, my last two years overseas. So I would always go play basketball and come back do baseball. I would go play basketball, come back. And then at one point, dude, I was just like, man, I felt like I was a, a father walking out on my kids, you know, because I started finding a passion for giving back all the stuff that I went through over the last 10-plus years. So um, that's when I started my baseball academy to where I am now, man. It's, it's just because I got tired of going overseas, and then I, I found a purpose in life, and I found the passion for what I was doing. And, and that's when, you know, I just decided to retire at that point uh, after my – I think I did overseas basketball for seven years, eight years. So that's like my seventh to eighth year. I, I, after my seven, eight year in basketball, I was just like, it's a wrap. Like, we'd be at Fundy. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it was crazy. I, I look at that movie, <laughs> you know, like in life, like when uh, they out there reading the, uh, when Eddie Murphy and them reading the little letters in jail, and then you start seeing over time people, people just, disappear. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'll be talking to you at Fundy, then tomorrow, then you went gone. Where you go? Oh, he gone. The next day, somebody else gone. So then you start having that pressure, like, man, like every, I didn't like basketball overseas because I didn't like the, you know, I, I always tell people, you're not a professional until you don't know where your next contract coming from. 
that's when you really find out if you're a professional athlete or not because it's easy to bust your ass and grind when you know I got this million dollar deal on the table and I'm good. But when you get in basketball, every year was a grind. Like right, right. I signed with Utah for three years, bro. I never forget. I signed my my after my second year, I made the all uh, I made the all the uh, the Qatari team. They signed me to a three year deal. So I went to go play on the Cups with another team because I was the the, the best import in the league. So my original team who signed me with a three year deal was like, you know what? We done with you. You you a traitor. You go play with them. And I'm like, damn, y'all just signed me for three years. Like, you just going to take away my contract like that? And they ripped that's, it up. That's your, it. Man, I'm glad you said that, bro, because people don't understand how unprofessional things can be and things can get in Europe. Similar situation happened with me. And granted, I did something to, to, to you know what I'm saying, to that led to that. But in the contract, I was supposed to be on the contract for two years, right? Mm-hmm. So after the first year, the first team I ever played for in Moscow, the team re- the team revoked my contract, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, for far as fine print and contractually, my deal is supposed to be for, you know what I'm saying, supposed to be two for two years. years. Yeah. And so like, this, that's good. I mean, that's, uh, people don't understand, man. When you, when you go play professionally overseas, man, like it's a lot of, a lot of hoops and a lot of stuff you're going to go through, man, and especially if you don't have a, a good agent or if you don't know exactly what's going on in your contract, man, you can get, you can get, you can get messed over, man. You can get messed over. Uh, so, and, and to, to talk about that, bro, it's funny. Cause I think I played in, like, I played in Syria. So I was out there with uh, your old teammate. Well, you're one of the guys you used to play with Samaki Walker. I was out there with Samaki out there in, uh, in Syria. And I came home, they they put us on lockdown, and all that's when all the bombing started in Aleppo. And I never forget my last year, bro. That's when I knew I was done, dog. It was like, what year was this? 2012? Yeah, 29. This was this was 12. Uh, we come in, we have a workout. Like uh, the coach come down from uh we was in what's the name of this country? Uh, God dang it, I can't. It was in Africa. Um uh, Tunisia. We was in Tunisia, you know. So the coach come down from Tunisia, we got a private workout. Like, I, it was three of us, and he signed me. He's like, I like you. So I ended up signing the contract. So I get my little bit of a, you know how you get half now, and you're supposed to get the other half when you get down there. You know how that go. So I get down there. I never forget, we are, at, we are at practice. Like, we are at practice, and the president of the club walk in. And he's like, who are you? And I'm like, what? I'm like, you signed me to a contract. He said, no, I don't know who you are. Like. He like, we don't have no money to sign you to a contract. I'm like, well, your coach just came down to America. He like, yeah, but he was supposed to go down there to buy some cars and ship them back to Tunisia. What? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> what? Not, bro. what? But yeah, the coach, yeah, the coach, the coach told the agent he was coming down here to work out kids. But long story short, he was coming down here to family, buy some cars, some forerunners, and ship them back across the waters. So I get down there and get ready to play. The president comes in. I play like he tells me he don't know who I am. He didn't give the coach authority to sign me. They don't have to give me the – so he get, the coach gave me half of his money as a signing bonus, and they don't have the other half to pay me. So I play like four or five games because the president going to tell me like, hey, I'm going to get you your money. Just keep playing. I'm going off. And then the, the, a week later, he comes tell me the team folded. You know, and I'm like, what? So after that, I was like, I'm done with basketball. Right. Like, I'm done. So that's what it's, I'm done. <laughs> the tale, I'm going to tell you, man, if we did a, all the guys we know, if we round them up and did us just have people just tell just one of their craziest stories, man, like we could write a bestseller book, bro. Like, book, bro. people don't understand how crazy stuff gets overseas, man. And like, stuff is really not guaranteed. Whether you sign the contract or not, on, on not even not on your end, so of course you you expect to receive your money and stuff on time. But on the team's end, like that mm-hmm. contract don't really mean nothing to them, uh, especially if they really want to try to get rid of you or really you know really not trying to pay you your money. Uh, hey, so one, go let, ahead. Let me, one story for 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 you start getting to what you for you start your stuff. It was hey I kid you. Hey, so look, let me tell you this funny story. Uh, I get to Syria and so unprofessional. I fly into Jordan because uh Amman because my passport my visa wasn't ready to go into Syria so I fly to Amman 
uh, and I had to stay there for like a week right, work, waiting on my work visa. So my work visa finally go through. Uh, so th let's say it's a Saturday. There are no flights going to Aleppo. So they want me to play in the game on Monday because they already gave me money. So like, well, you got to be here on Monday. We got to play. So what's my only option? I got to catch a taxi, bro. I caught... <laughs> I called a taxi. My agent was like, we're going to put you on, like, this nice taxi, dog. And uh, from Jordan to Aleppo, I might have been, like, an eight-hour drive, bro. So in I'm a in a taxi, the, bro. I'm in a taxi, dog, with an Arab, like, next to me, Taliban. Like, we driving through, like, Syria, bro, like, on in a taxi, dog. So I get there. I go straight to the physical office, right? I go straight and get a physical. And then I get on the team bus and go straight to play a game in Damascus, which is like four hour drive away. So in 24 hours, I had an eight hour plane ride, an eight hour taxi drive. And then I get there, get a physical. And then after the physical, I get right on the bus to go play in the game four hours the other direction. So I get to the game and you know me, like I'm gonna shoot that thing. Like I'm, I'm gonna put that thing up. Like at the end of the day, <laughs> <laughs> if I see one go in, I'm good. So I mean, I had a horrible game. I stopped probably still ended up with like 20, but I I put up so many shots, man. My legs were shot. So I get back on the bus, dog. I get back to my apartment, and I open the door. And somebody sitting on the couch, and I'm like, "Yo, who are you?" <laughs> he like, "Oh man, they called me in from this other country to come play, bro." The dude, was like my replacement, was like right there, dog. <laughs> With, yeah. within, yeah, within the matter of like that game in Damascus coming back to Syria, I get back there. It's another American in my apartment, bro. Only so in like, Europe. Oh. Yeah, I'm like, who are you? He's like, oh man, they called me in. They flew me in uh, from the next country over uh, this morning. And I'm like, bro, so the season ended up getting shut down, but I'm just laughing, thinking about the stories of how my replacement was already like there, like after they didn't take into consideration that I had to drive a taxi and do all that to get to the game. But, but now I'll let you finish talking. That was a story I had to tell. Yeah, that, only in Europe, man, like people couldn't imagine some of the stories that guys have uh, just dealing with different issues and different situations in Europe. That's like completely unacceptable and completely unprofessional. Right. Just, you would never imagine. Cause you thinking everything is like, Oh man, you know, cause you really never know how much a guy is making. So you, mm -hmm. You just hearing, oh, this guy went to this country and he's supposed to be making this amount of money. Oh, he's, he's, you know, you just thinking like everything is all good. And, you know, and like you said, like, even when, when people have become professionals at any level, like you still, you still, you still normal. Like you still have yeah. bills to pay. Yeah. You still have problems that's going to come up. You still, you know, you still have life is still continuing for you, but then it gets a, a little more complicated when you play overseas, when, your teams make it difficult because they're unprofessional and, you know, they don't do things the right way. They're late on the money, on your payments. Now, mind you, you in another country, a foreign country, and life is still happening uh, for, for your family or, you know, or for you uh, back at home where you're from, right? And so they're, they're inconveniencing a lot of things on your behalf when they don't do things the right way or when they do things, you know what I'm saying, out of line or unprofessional that, you know, that puts you in a bind with stuff that you have going on that, that's supposed to be guaranteed. Uh, but man, before, before, before I let you go, Josh, uh, we got to talk about, you know, your, and you was, you started to talk about it a little bit, but we got to talk about, you know, you, you know, you giving back and you starting uh, the Texas Blue Chips Academy and uh, kind of, you know, uh, yeah, like I said, you, you started talking about it a little bit, but why you started it and, 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 and the things you have done up until this point. Yeah. Um, so I started the Blue Trip Academy um, 2014 is when we started, when I started the academy. And uh, I was, I'm, I'm in it more so for the mentorship side and more so of being the vessel to show that the, show the kids that everything is possible. Um, so that was more my approach with it. Like I'm not, I'm not trying, like I tell these kids and the parents, I'm not impressed by superstars at 12 years old. Like I'm not impressed with superstars. Like I want you to earn something in life. So, so my main thing is when I started the blue chips, I was always about development and I'm still about development. And I feel like 
it's a bigger purpose behind sports. So my main my main motto is is um for the blue chips, I say building better building better baseball players, but above all better men. You know, so I'm I'm all about the development from the outside in and the in, I mean the inside out. Like baseball is is what you do, but you're gonna be a husband and you're gonna be a father a lot longer than you're gonna be an athlete. So, you know, my my motto is, you know, I'm just I'm into the 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 building better kids process of in sports. Baseball is just the avenue to go with it, you know. Oh man, now that's and that's what it's all about ultimately. That's what it's all about, man. The you know, you have the right people that's involved in you sports, they understand that, you know, it, it's it's not so much about having the best talent. And of course, you know, you want to have good talent on your in your programs and on your teams, but it's more so about helping these kids, developing these kids, teaching them how to become young men and women, uh, you know, te- you know, teaching them, you know, about, you know, teaching them valuable life lessons that comes along with, you know, being involved in youth sports and, and uh, just, you know, being a mentor and a consultant for, uh, for some of these kids, because for whatever reason, every kid has a different, you know, have a different experience, different background. So that, I mean, that's really what it's all about, man. So uh, salute to you, bro. Like definitely, man, salute to you for, all that you've accomplished, man, for the for the uniquely uh, unique uh, story that you have of being a <laughs> of being a pro athlete at 17 years old, straight out of high school, getting drafted to the MLB uh, as a young black man, uh, you know, going through your, your your early years of you know being being a professional at, at baseball and still playing hoops in college and, and and you know and being able to be successful at that. And having enough talent uh, to be able to do that as a professional, once your base, once you decided that baseball was enough for you, man, like that's that's a hell of a story, Jay Jones. Like, like I said, I, I definitely had to get you on here, man, to let people hear your story and, and become more familiar who you are and what you accomplished. Because it's not too many people. I don't care how good about that that's can say that they're a two sport professional athlete, you know. Uh, not too many people that can say they can that say they can do that or have done that. Uh, so, man, I salute you, bro. I appreciate you taking the time to, to join me, man. Uh, all the best with everything you got going forward. Yeah, indeed, man. Uh, you know, like I always told you, man, I'm proud of you too as well, man. To see, uh, to be at that level, and then also to to see your journey from EA Jones, man. To see your journey at, from from Fundy, from the superstars to Willow Ridge. Uh, I tell them stories all the time about really I still have nightmares about that press y'all run. But from Riddle Ridge to Duke, I mean, to playing at Duke, man, and, and, and playing in the league and playing overseas, man, you've always been so humble through it all, man. But you you deserve your kudos too, man. You, you've you definitely a, a, a legend, you know, in the city, in the state. You, you, you're a staple, man. So you're humble about it. But I want you to know, man, everything you've accomplished never goes unnoticed, man. So... I see you also giving back, and I see you working, you and TJ doing y'all thing over there, and Kenny, and y'all still close, man. So uh, I'm looking from afar as well, man. So I'm proud of you also. Oh, man, it's all love. I definitely appreciate that, bro. Uh, but like I said, appreciate you taking time out your day, man. Right. Go, I go and, appreciate it, for sure, man. Go, 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 go. Enjoy yourself. I know it's your day off. Your son's not home, man. So yeah. go, go enjoy yourself, man. Have a good time. All right, D. Thank you, man. All right, man, all love. Peace.